the end of an era for the Thunder Bay Generating Station. Local runners reflect on the anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing. And five dead following a Calgary stabbing spree. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The last piece of coal has been burned at the Thunder Bay Generating Station. The province announced today that Ontario is now the first jurisdiction in North America to fully eliminate coal as a source of electricity generation. But it's not a day for celebration. According to the Regional Energy Task Force, a large supplier of power in the Northwest is now offline and jobs will be moving out of the community. Jonathan Wilson has more. The last bucket load of coal at the Thunder Bay Generating Station was burned last week. The OPG plant on Mission Island has been up and running on coal since 1963. Regional plant manager Chris Freilich says it's a bittersweet day. While that chapter in our history comes to a close, uh, we're excited about uh, you know, what it means for us from, from here on into the future with uh, the introduction of, of advanced biomass and, and the future of the station. So there's, uh, there's definitely some mixed emotions uh, by, uh, by myself and the staff. The Liberal government says Ontario has fulfilled its commitment to end coal generation in advance of its target of the end of the year. But Ian Angus feels the province is being hypocritical it's about hypocritical the milestone. Though, According to the co-chair of the Energy Task Force, the province continues to purchase power produced with coal from other jurisdictions. It's not a day to celebrate uh, from that perspective. Uh, the fact that we're losing 45 jobs to southern Ontario uh, with a $4 million payroll hit to uh, the community of Thunder Bay is not something to celebrate. Work is now underway to convert the local plant to burn advanced biomass. If a fuel supply is secured and approvals are in place, Freilich says the plant could be back up and running by January 2015. But what happens beyond the five-year agreement to burn biomass remains an unknown. I'd like to see a future beyond uh, the five years, and I guess ultimately that'll uh, be somewhat dependent on the change in the demand uh, here in the Northwest. So if, uh, if that does pick up and there is a you know, new need from new mines and other sources, uh, you know, anything's possible. The Energy Task Force continues to believe the plant must be converted to natural gas so there is the ability to produce 300 megawatts of power. We have evidence that says we're going to need that, that kind of power uh, starting in about 2017, 2018 in order to make sure that all these mines that are working their way through the, the planning process will be able to come online. Jonathan Wilson, TBT News. The Thunder Bay Police Services Board is trying to decide what to do with more than $2,000 in illegal drug money. That was just one of the topics at today's board meeting. And city police are also planning to improve its 911 service for the hearing impaired. Rochelle Sufi has more. First subject on the police board agenda was the sole source purchase to upgrade the 911 answering system. Inspector Sylvie Hoth says they are currently mandated by the CRTC that all systems must be able to offer text 911 to subscribers that are hard of hearing by January 2015. It made more sense to continue with the current system that we have in place uh, and upgrade from what we have already established. Because this cost is well above the 60000 uh, which is usually uh, referred to tender or uh, at that point, we needed the permission of the board uh, to spend the, I think it's $178,000 to move forward. The tentative schedule for installation is the first two weeks of September. Meanwhile, the board discussed what to do with the more than $2,200 that was seized during the course of the two drug investigations in 2010. No rightful owner has laid claim to this seized money. And since it's been more than three months going unclaimed under the Police Services Act, the board may use it for any purpose that it considers in the public interest. My recommendation was that uh, we use the $2,200 to go towards outfitting our frontline supervisors with conductive energy weapons. The board also dealt with the first quarter variance report for its 2014 operational budget. The year-end variance as of March 31st is projected to be less than 1%. Levesque hopes the new consolidated courthouse, which officially opened for business last week, will be a positive offset. There's efficiencies in, in different things in preparing court briefs, uh, things of that nature. We're going to electronic disclosure as opposed to paper. So there, there are certain ways, and of course it's very time consuming uh, to prepare a full court document or docket with uh, uh, paper. 
So if we put it, put it electronically and give it to the Crown attorneys, it's, it's far more efficient, should save us some time. Rochelle Sufi, TBT News. Thunder Bay Police are investigating a pair of break and enter attempts. The first happened just before midnight on East Wall Street when two males dressed in dark hoodies knocked on the door of a home before trying to gain entry. The pair then fled on bicycles after the homeowners were awakened. A second similar incident was reported about an hour later on Hamilton Avenue. There were no injuries in either incident. Councillor Ken Boschkoff is expressing his disappointment that a Terry Fox Museum likely won't be set up in Thunder Bay. City staff contacted the Fox family about roughly 200,000 artifacts they've collected. But their vision is for a museum and research centre in the Vancouver area. Also last night, Council made a move to keep a portion of Prince Arthur's Landing in the hands of the public. Dennis Ward reports. Councillor Ken Boschkoff believes there is a lot of support in Thunder Bay and area to house the Terry Fox collection in the city. The archivist did contact the family to explore the possibility. However, their vision is for a 50,000 square foot facility in the Vancouver area. But Boschkoff feels the idea wasn't pursued in an enthusiastic manner, in part because it's felt there isn't a spot big enough to put the items on display. Making a pitch simply isn't kind of Oh, you need that much square footage? Uh, okay, bye. Uh, I uh, believe that we are in the current discussions for uh, something that used to be called a multiplex but is now an event center that has an enormous amount of square footage that uh, could have or still could uh, be home to some of this. Councillor Aldo Roberto disagrees with Boschkoff's assessment. The city didn't act quick enough or care enough about the idea. Roberto understands the family's wishes to locate a permanent home for the collection in British Columbia. To respect the family and to respect their rights, I think we're doing the right thing by saying, you know, well, if the family wants to put it there, we're going to go along with the family. I, I, I applaud Mr. Boschkoff for, uh, Council Boschkoff, for bringing this up, but I do think we did try. The Fox family are creating a traveling exhibit that will tour the country beginning next year. The city will work to bring that exhibit to Thunder Bay. In other matters, council has decided to take a piece of Prince Arthur's Landing off the market and keep it in the hands of the public. This pertains to the grassed area that's kitty corner to the splash pad. It's got the uh, colorful Muskoka, uh, Muskoka style lawn chairs on it. Uh, very popular with the community as a result. Um, this land was originally uh, allotted for future private development. Um, we have reversed that. Dennis Ward, TBT News. Exactly a year ago, one of the world's premier sporting events was rocked by tragedy. Today marks the anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings. And if the attacker's goal was to intimidate, it didn't work. Next Monday, thousands of runners will gather at the start line for the 118th edition of the iconic race. Twelve of them are from right here in Thunder Bay. Ryan Benazzo brings us the story of two of those athletes who are returning not just despite last year's attack, but because of it. Running can cleanse the mind. Many believe it to be therapeutic. Few know that as well as longtime friends Susan McDonald and Deborah Fredrickson. They were each just minutes away. Fredrickson had just completed the race, McDonald on her final mile, when the two bombs rocked Boylston Street near the finish line of last year's Boston Marathon. But rather than scare them away from the world-renowned event, last year's tragedy has strengthened their resolve to compete again this time around. It will be um, actually a privilege and an honor to go back and run it again. Three people were killed. 260 others were injured. Fredrickson feels it's her duty to run Boston again in honor of those who no longer can. They took something away from us. Um, like, to me, they, they try to make something awful of a very special experience and a very special run. We're strong and you're not going to make us stop. We are going to run. Though the veteran marathon runners have competed in several races since Boston, they acknowledge next Monday will be emotional. Still, they'll prepare for the 118th running of the Boston Marathon like they would any other race. And let the emotion come as it may. 
We're just going to, we're going to enjoy it yeah. and make the we, best of it. Yeah. For McDonald, this will be her 10th Boston Marathon. For Fredrickson, her seventh. Some may not fully understand the pair's desire to return. They have a hard time articulating it themselves. What they do know is, this is simply what they do. When somebody <laughs> says, why do you run? We say, because we can. And when they say, when will you stop? When I can't. And if they have anything to say about it, that day is still a long way off. Ryan Bonazzo, TBT News. A huge icebreaker has arrived in Thunder Bay. The Pierre Radisson is an ocean vessel which has been reassigned to Lake Superior to help get traffic moving through the thick ice. The Radisson is currently fueling up at Kiefer Terminal starting tomorrow. It will head to Isle Royale to escort a convoy of American ships coming from Duluth to Sault Ste. Marie. Harbour Master Guy Jarvis says the journey currently takes four days as the ice in some areas is 36 to 48 inches thick. The captain of the Radisson has described the lake conditions near the Sioux as severe or extreme. Jarvis says it's only because of the constant work by the Radisson and other icebreakers that our port is almost ready. This is uh, one of the heavier Canadian assets to, to break up ice in uh, Lake Superior uh, and in the Arctic. Um, it is noteworthy to, uh, to know that the Canadian uh, Coast Guard has now announced there will be a third icebreaker come to Lake Superior to assist in the, uh, the breaking of the ice. The Gatmai Bay, the Morro Bay, the Mackinac, the Pierre Radisson. So there's been a whole complement of icebreakers in the port uh, uh, routinely breaking things up at the shipping lanes. The Radisson and the ships from Duluth should arrive in Sault Ste. Marie this weekend. Then it will lead the way for another convoy of ships to come from the Sioux to Thunder Bay by the middle of next week. That will be the latest the local port has ever welcomed its first cargo ship. The previous record of April 14th was set back in the 1970s. Two people are in custody following a pursuit along Highway 17 yesterday. It happened following the report of the theft of fuel from a White River gas station. OPP officers later spotted a suspect vehicle east of Marathon and tried to pull it over, but the car sped away and a pursuit was abandoned for safety reasons. The vehicle was then spotted on Highway 627 south of the Pick River First Nation and a spike belt deployed, but when the driver tried to avoid it, he lost control and ended up in a ditch. A 24-year-old man and an 18-year-old female from southern Ontario have been arrested. They're facing several charges. It's a 20-year plan aimed at making Ontario accessible to people of all ability levels. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act was introduced back in 2005. And today, a provincially appointed independent reviewer was in Thunder Bay to assess the impact the act has had on those lives of those with disabilities. It's the for such consultation for Mayo Moran, who was chosen last fall by the province to review Ontario's accessibility laws. The Dean of the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law says while few dispute the goals laid out in the Act are noble, she's heard some concern when it comes to implementation and enforcement. And it's clear that some businesses and employers don't know what their obligations are. It's a rolling implementation, so it's, it can be hard to know what you're obliged to do at any particular moment. So, you know, some of the things that people are telling me is how can we improve that and ensure that everybody knows what they need to do when. There's still no timeline for a report to be tabled. Moran is the second provincially appointed reviewer tasked with examining Ontario's accessibility laws. Following on the heels of former cabinet minister Charles Beer, who was issued his report back in 2010. A pair of community programs were given a helping hand today thanks to local high school students. Almost $10,000 was raised for the Community Clothing Assistance Program and the Evergreen, a United Neighbourhood Youth Hubs Program. The money was raised through the annual United Way High School Challenge. The two schools which raised the most per capita were Dennis Franklin Cromarty and Hammershold. The money raised was then put through the Youth for Community program. And eight high school students worked with the United Way to decide which charities would receive a portion of the funds. Rochelle Roussel is part of the Youth Granting Committee and she's proud to be helping out programs that benefit the young people in our community. This is a really cool opportunity as a student because I got to be part of my SAC's um, uh, fundraising opportunity. Uh, we got to raise over $5,000 just for this, um, these programs here. And it's just really cool to be able to like 
have a part in the in their success and to know that they are doing good for our community and that will reflect based like on our youth today. I think it's wonderful. Uh, with the United Way, we're always trying to get young people involved. We've got a Gen Next group now that uh, to try and get young uh, young adults involved in it. And the younger the uh, the people are, that they start to find out what uh, what philanthropy is all about. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. Roussel says they chose Evergreen because they were looking for a simple improvement to a unique program they run for youth. The Clothing Assistance Group was chosen because they were looking to develop a program that provides job skills to at-risk youth. The Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra is playing free concerts throughout the week to thank the community for their continued support. Last night was the first time the symphony played at the regional hospital. The musicians played eight pieces ranging from classic to contemporary to pop. The city has officially proclaimed this week as the first annual Thunder Bay Symphony Orchestra Week. TBSO Music Director Arthur Post says they have a lot of events planned for the next few days. My colleague uh, Daniel Bartholomew Poiser, the associate conductor, is going to be conducting a number of concerts in the schools. So in addition in this what we call what we're calling TBSO Week, uh, we have a combination of these outreach concerts plus educational concerts in the schools. The three school concerts will be held at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, Ecole Franco Superior and Lavarandre High School.